Welcome to the Lend Academy podcast, episode number 71. This is your host, Peter Renton, founder of Lend Academy. Today on the show, we actually have two guests. I'm delighted to welcome the two co-founders of StreetShares, Mark Rockefeller, who's the CEO, and Mickey Conson, who is the COO. These gentlemen met uh, about three years ago, and they had a shared vision. They wanted to do something about the lack of capital that was available for, for small businesses, and they created Street Shares, which is really one of the more unique companies in our space. They have a very unique approach that they call an affinity approach, both on the borrower and investor side, and we'll get into that in some detail. Now, they also have made their investment available to non-accredited investors recently. That's also something that's quite unique. Now, I've been an investor for over a year now. I've got to know the platform pretty well. I spent some time with Mark on our recent uh, trip to China, and I found them a fascinating company, so I wanted to get them on the show. I think we all can, uh, we can all learn a lot from Street Shares. Hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the podcast, Mickey and Mark. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Great to be here. So I, I guess let's just get started. I, I'd like to start with each of you to just give a little bit of background about yourself, let the listeners know kind of where you've come from. This is sort of your career arc before you started Street Chess. Yeah, yeah, sure. This is Mark. I'll go first. This is Mark Rockefeller. Uh, I was in the military for nine years, was a military lawyer, a JAG officer, which most folks only know what that is if they've seen the movie with Tom Cruise in it, and uh, was a military prosecutor. And so helped, you know, served across the globe, but uh, you know, had the chance to serve in Iraq. Uh, the most interesting job was actually worked as a criminal prosecutor, working under General Petraeus and bringing some charges against terrorist suspects in Iraq. So sort of a domestic war crimes tribunal. So that was, that, that was rather interesting work for a young prosecutor. Indeed, indeed. Um, was in the military for nine years and then got out and uh, went to work uh, at the D.C. office of a Wall Street law firm called Milbank, Tweed, Hadley & McCloy. So that was basically a securities and bankruptcy type litigation. Dealt quite a bit with the uh, Lehman Brothers bankruptcy and the aftermath of that, uh, trying to put the pieces back together a little bit and get some investors their money back. And then in uh, 2012, the Jobs Act passed. And I think like a lot of people, uh, took an interest in the potential within the JOBS Act from an access to capital perspective. Uh, I've always been interested in, you know, opening up, you know, some of the securities that are only available to wealthier people, opening those up to the general public. And so I took an interest in all things, you know, sort of crowdfunding, peer-to-peer lending, JOBS Act related. And then it was at that point when it had sort of the germ of an idea for street shares was able to uh, meet with Mickey, and then he and I began to iterate on this idea that has since become Street Shares. Okay, so then that's uh, that's a fascinating kind of uh, way you sort of approach this. I imagine going from uh, terror suspects to Lehman Brothers must have been interesting, but uh... <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, but they 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 have some things in common, I imagine. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, let's not go there. <laughs> yes. yes. Anyway, anyway, Mickey, what about you? What was what's your what's your background? Sure. No, thanks, Peter. Happy to be on. So I, um, I'm originally from South Africa, which is why my accent is only tangentially similar to yours. But, yes. um, but I worked at McKinsey for a few years over there, uh, doing a lot of work in uh, various African countries in the late 90s and came over here and joined Capital One uh, in 2001. I spent a lot of time there uh, helping to build out their small business units where I built out all the credit functions and ended up kind of helping to, to, to run kind of the global operations of that, of that business. I had moved on uh, in my last few years to help with the acquisition and integration of various banks uh, and had overall credit uh, responsibility for the, for the retail bank uh, at Capital One and the consumer and the small business side. So similar to Mark, I was, I was pretty intrigued by the Jobs Act and was trying to think about how to get back into, into small business at a time where all of the, the, the sort of big banks were, were really starting to pull back from that space. And so was, uh, was thinking about doing, you know, a funding startup in the, in the business space when, uh, when Mark and I met. So that's my, uh, that's my background and how we, how we got together. So how actually did you meet? Did you meet with the idea of starting a company together or what was the genesis of it? 
The blind date. <laughs> 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 no, we did. We uh, th- th- there was a there was a mutual friend who actually heard both of us, you know, talking about the Jobs Act and peer to peer lending and Lending Club and Prosper and this sort of you know you know rapidly growing industry. This is back in uh, late 2012, early 2013, and so he said, "You guys have to get together. You guys have to meet." And so we met uh, for breakfast one morning in a local diner here outside Washington D.C. And as we say, the uh, the waffles were stale, the uh, coffee was cold, but the conversation was actually pretty interesting. And, you know, began to iterate on this, this idea around, you know, building a marketplace lending platform, but one that was really oriented toward where we thought the industry was going, uh, as opposed to where it had been. Uh, in particular, and, and I'm sure we'll discuss this a little bit, this idea of using affinity groups to de-risk the lending process, which the Jobs Act now made possible because you could, you could bring in retail investors uh, and, then, and then have them match these loans. So that was the original idea, and you know, like, like most ideas, it, it you know, grows and evolves, and you bounce it off people you know, with, with a lot of experience, and it's shaped by a lot of different you know, minds. But it's uh, you know, uh, really turned into something that we're quite proud of at this point. Great. So then why don't you just tell everybody who don't know about street shares what, what you actually offer? What is your product offering? Yeah, yeah. So we do small business loans between two thousand and a hundred thousand dollars, as well as lines of credit. The term loans are between three months uh, and thirty-six months, at least right now. Loans go up to a hundred thousand, and then the line of credit product we just launched last month and has shown to be, be be quite popular. We are based outside of Washington D.C. and we've got let's see about twenty-three employees right now, and we launched in the summer of uh, twenty fourteen. So we're a little over two years old this point. Okay. And I think, you know, Peter, it's probably worth kind of differentiating our products a little bit from, from what's out there. So one of the things that, you know, one of sort of our early, you know, our, our early decisions we made was that we, we weren't going to build another subprime small business lender. You know, there's a, there's a lot of those out there. Certainly in some, in some ways you could say that's where there's a lot of money, but it wasn't something that, you know, we, we were going to leave our secure jobs and, and you know, kind of start up a, you know, a business and, and not feel incredibly proud about what we do every day. And when you overlay that with the affinities that we're looking to serve here, you know, our product set is, uh, is quite different. So, you know, we're incredibly transparent about our rates uh, to our borrowers. We quote everything from, you know, APR to any of the other rates that, that are out there. We have more of a prime plus borrower base than I think is, is typical uh, in the industry because we want to be really responsible in how we lend. So the idea of, of being kind of a white hat lender in the industry is one that's one that's really important for us and has helped sort of shape a lot of the decisions that we've made around how we built our, our business and, and obviously uh, as it's brought to life in the, in the products that we offer both to our borrowers but also the, the investors. Okay. Well, I want to talk about the borrowers for a little bit. I know you talked about the affinity approach, but I want to find out like who are the borrowers and if you could explain, you know, where, like, I guess where they're coming from and who, who are the typical borrowers that are coming to street shares today? Yeah. So we have, you know, as part of our affinity approach, uh, we have signed several dozen partnerships with many military organizations, both for-profit and non-profit. Some of them are, are organizations that, you know, that may, for, for example, serve, you know, serve the military community or the military small, the, the veteran small business community, for example, Fedbit. And, but some of them are, are non-military partners. And we source a lot of our borrowers through these partnerships. So some of it is through social media, some of it is uh, through direct targeting, sometimes through their channels and sometimes through, through our own unique channels. But we're pretty focused on, on building up you know, our own kind of proprietary you know, targeting uh, capabilities within, uh, within kind of the, the affinities. And we're, we've been really focused on the military veteran small business market, which uh, is about 15% of, of all small businesses. So we've, we've really focused on, on that niche. And so about two thirds of our borrowers are veterans. Uh, they're, they're military veteran small business owners, and about a third of them uh, are not. Uh, the typical profile is more, you know, upmarket than uh, uh, than I think is typical in the industry in terms of the the product set that we uh, that we have out there. So they tend to be using consumer language, uh, more prime plus uh, borrowers. Okay, so then the, you mentioned Mark earlier. The affinity approach is somewhat. 
it, it helps lower risk. I mean, what can you elaborate on that? And do you have any any actual numbers that to back up that claim? And, and what what has been your experience? Yeah, yeah, we do. So when when we first got together, we we had this theory around affinity based lending, and by that what we mean is that you acquire your borrowers through affinity channels, and you match them up with backers or investors who share that affinity. So the example here would be uh, military veterans or the military community, for example, backing loans to veteran-owned small businesses. And uh, when we got together, we had this this sort of this theory that if you could back loans with capital from retail investors with whom the borrower uh, shares some strong bonds, and you make that relationship quite transparent and known to the borrower, and we're trying to do some things to sort of, sort of, sort of maximize that you know, knowledge of that relationship after the loan is made, what you could do actually is tap into the borrower's sense of duty, their sense of obligation to repay the loan. You know, folks borrow and they pay back a loan based on willingness to pay and ability to pay. And we felt like there's psychological bonds within certain affinity groups that you could tap into to actually increase the borrower's willingness to pay. Uh, that is, move up the credit stack a little bit. So we launched with this model in July 2014. We looked at several different affinity groups to start with. Veterans were the fairly obvious one to begin with. That's both Mickey and my background, you know, outside of Washington, D.C., you know, we could we could partner with all the veterans organizations with kind of multi-year exclusive partnerships. Uh, it was a sizable market. And as Mickey said, there's a uh, about 15% of small businesses in the U.S. are owned by veterans. It was a space where I had a lot of, you know, strong contacts. And so we really felt like that was the great affinity group to start with. And then after about two years now of doing that, the the affinity-backed loans, even if you equalize or, or, or normalize for other factors of credit risk, the affinity back loans on our platform are uh, demonstrably less risky than the non affinity back loans. You know, if a, if a borrower is, you know, behind on a payment, you know, based on this affinity model, they will call us and they will apologize and they will cure because they don't want to let down the retail investors. And so we're seeing some very, very strong data, some, some nice sort of green shoots that, that, you know, prove our original model. And so now for us, it's simply a matter of, you know, when and where do you move into other affinity groups beyond veterans? Okay, but I want to stick to, stick to that veterans right just for now. I mean, you, you mentioned that, they're, that they, it's less risky and you're comparing apples to apples. So does that, mean, does that mean you can go down the credit spectrum for veterans because they're less risky? I mean, what's, what's your approach to underwriting these people? You mentioned you don't, you're not, you're not, you don't want to do subprime small business lending. I mean, there's plenty of those out there, but what? So, what is your approach when you're underwriting these people? Yeah, we've not elected to go down the credit spectrum, but veteran-owned businesses on our platform certainly get a discount in our credit model just based on that fact. So, we 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 are using the fact that they're veterans. We are using the data that we're seeing about this affinity model uh, to make sure that veterans get get a better rate. A veteran-owned small business looking for a loan in America, I don't think there's any alternative lender out there that will give them a better rate than we do because they actually get credit for that, for that veteran status on street shares. Yeah, I mean, one, one of the things, Peter, that we uh, obviously we're tracking, you know, tremendous amounts of data related to our, our borrowers that we collect up front. Um, and uh, we do collect a significant amount of data, including about service record. And, and so over time, we're able to rebalance our models around, you know, what is, you know, what, what is risky and what is less risky. And so, you know, as an example, for instance, you know, we, we do understand the risk benefit between veterans and non-veterans, but we, we also understand that veterans do better in certain sectors. And so a veteran in a particular sector has an advantage over a non-veteran, uh, and so there could be an additional discount provided there. And so what we tend to do with that is actually play into uh, those areas in a more strong way. And so we tend to target them more with our partners in terms of uh, acquiring borrowers, but also tend to lend more money out to those, to those businesses. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, uh, affinity groups, veterans, uh, they're a somewhat unique affinity group, I would even argue, because, you know, you're going into harm's way, you're risking your life. I mean, you, you hear about the bonds that people have you know, in, in, within their units, especially, um, but with, with all veterans. You, so is that, how, how transferable is that to other affinity groups? Because I would argue that veterans are pretty unique. 
Yeah, I think that, that's a very fair question. We don't yet know sort of the outer contours, the outer boundary of this affinity model. We, we have, you know, other affinity groups that we're looking at. We've had a couple of test balloons up in some other affinity groups. We believe that we'll see some of the same type credit performance. But, but I think it's a very fair question. Veterans certainly have a uniquely strong bond. And so the question is, as you move into other affinity groups, you know, how, how strong will that be? It's been quite strong with veterans. And so I think if you can even move the needle, you know, let's say 5, five 10%, on the risk spectrum based on affinity loyalty, uh, that's substantial, right? That's, that's, that's meaningful. In the veteran space, it's actually been quite a bit larger than that. Right. Okay. So I want to move to the other side of the marketplace here and talk about your investors. Obviously, you have, you have plenty of veteran investors, it sounds like, but can you describe how, like the types of investors, obviously, I think you, like you said before, you've had, you have institutional investors as well as uh, individuals, but who who are the typical investors on your platform today? Yeah, so we have several sources of capital that we use to back the loans, as well as our own, which is a fairly important point that we co-invest in every loan that we make. We believe that's the right thing to do. We believe that it brings trust from our investors. Uh, and so we put our own balance sheet capital into each loan, uh, less than 10% right now, but, but of each loan. We have two institutional funds, that are providing us with capital. Those are, in essence, multi-year commitments in the several hundred million dollar range. And then we have a body of Reg D accredited retail investors. And then as of April, we launched under Reg A Plus to be able to access the non-accredited retail investor base as well. And uh, in a short 60 days or so since then, the non-accredited base has actually surpassed uh, the accredited base in terms of raw numbers. So we do draw capital from, in essence, those four sources, our own balance sheet, institutional investors, accredited retail investors, and then now uh, non-accredited retail investors as well. So, so let's talk about that Reg A Plus offering. I mean, accredited investors, obviously, there's, there's, there's lots of options for accredited investors today, but for non-accredited, the offerings uh, outside of Lending Club and Prosper are highly limited. So tell us about that process and how it works and you know, what kind of... Th- I guess, the size of, of the offering and just describe what you went through. Yeah, yeah. Th- th- this is one of the more interesting things that we've done beyond the affinity approach, which is certainly certainly unique as well. Reg A plus is found in Section 4 of the JOBS Act. Uh, and so going back to sort of the genesis of street shares, right, you had two founders that were excited about the potential of the JOBS Act. This is really the realization of that potential. Reg A plus took effect in uh, June 2015, so just last summer. We filed that same month with the SEC, and it took some time to sort of work its way through the SEC. They were actually quite helpful to us. I mean, it, it, it really was a case where we were trying to do something, I think, novel. It was a new statute that the regulators themselves were trying to figure out, and they were quite helpful in actually working with us and our outside counsel to make sure that we could shape investor disclosures and a product here that would make sense. And so what we came up with was, in essence, a fixed return type product. And so it is a note issued by street shares. It is recourse to street shares at a fixed rate. That capital then is used, uh, along with our own capital, of course, accredited retail investor capital and, and our institutional capital to back these loans but it's not on a a loan-by-loan payment-dependent basis as it is with Lending Club and Prosper. We call the product right now business bonds, uh, for example, veteran business bonds, because it's a uh, a fixed rate uh, note at this time. One thing just to, uh, to kind of add in there is as, as we kind of looked at our investor base and, and researched uh, what they wanted, as well as, you know, did some research in the unaccredited kind of area, you know, what we found was similar to other investment categories, there, there are different types of investors, right? So there's the, you know, street shares day traders who are on every day, they're looking at every load, they're engaging with the content, you know, they're looking up every detail. There's investors that, you know, love the idea of being able to do that, but they just put it out order invest. And then there are others who just sort of invest their IRA through street shares. But as we looked at the, the unaccredited space, I think what we found was, uh, for the most part, the offerings that are out there are too complex for actually what, they, what they're looking for. What they're looking for is they love the idea of, of investing in kind of a new model. They love the idea of getting yield. Um, so we offer, you know, flat 5%. 
they particularly love the idea of street chairs of being able to, to invest in a particular affinity, uh, in our case, uh, military veterans. But frankly, they don't want all the complexity of having to go in and select loans and set up filters and, you know, get very lengthy monthly reports. They're looking for a very simple product. And so our product is one that's incredibly simple. You can sign up for it on your phone in, in probably literally 30 seconds and you can fund your account. And so it's really sort of a, it's a sort of very simplified experience for people who want exposure to this, uh, you know, to this asset base. And as a result of sort of offering a fixed 5%, they're obviously not exposed to the risk of the underlying loans. We manage that for them, and we have a, a loss provision fund in place to ensure that we can meet our obligations to, to those investors. And how, how did you come up with 5%? Yeah, so the way we came up with 5% was we wanted to make sure that it was a, you know, an exciting enough rate to, to tempt people to, you know, to come to sort of something that's new and new and innovative. Uh, about the highest you can get out there on, on you know, FDIC insured product is, is about 1% right now, maybe uh, 1 in 15 if you're, uh, if you're, if you're at Goldman. Uh, but that tends to be a very expensive rate. So 5% is, is way out of the, out of the reach of any of any sort of competing type CD product, which is which is really what this what this is is structured like without the FDIC insurance, but there's no direct credit loss, and so you know if you think that the lending club is is going to be in the sort of six to nine percent range, it doesn't have to be as as high as that because uh, it's provisioned with a fund on the back end, and so that's what what we did was we positioned it really between the sort of high high rate CD type products that are out there, but below the uh, direct exposure uh, risk products that are on the marketplace. And, and I would add that we, we, we sort of likened it almost to a to a CD type product because it shares many of those same features. I mean, obviously it's not insured, it's not FDIC insured, of course, but it is liquid. It is, you know, very easy to get into and out of, and it's it's not tied to the to the credit risk of any particular underlying loan. Right, but obviously you still have the, the platform risk if you, I mean, if you go out of business or, or, right. or is there, you know, is, is there, there's no bankruptcy remote structure with this provision fund? Yes, there is. Oh, there is. Okay. Okay. So that, that's something. So then what's the minimum investment? Are you open in all 50 states? What's going on there? Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the idea here is to build kind of a community. You know, we've, we've, we've been called in some circles sort of the first peer-to-peer lending or the first marketplace lending credit union. And I think there's a, you know, there's a bit of truth to that because we're sort of bringing people together that have a common bond, for example, veteran status. So the idea here is to build community, not so much taking a whole bunch of capital from these investors. And so we've actually capped how much they can invest. We launched this product actually at the Lended Conference in San Francisco in April with a cap of $1,000 per investor. We also launched it exclusive at the time only to the military community. Since then, we have increased that cap to 5000 So that's the most that you can invest uh, in street shares, biz bonds. Uh, and we have opened it up to those outside of the military community. So the cap right now is 5000 And, Peter, the, the reason that we're, we're sort of structured in this way is, as Mark said, what, what we're really trying to, trying to build here is, you know, two-sided marketplace as, as is as is out there, but but a, a marketplace that actually has interaction between it, and so there there are pretty significant uh, rewards for investors on that platform to refer both other investors but also borrowers, and we've started to see a steady stream of borrower referrals now coming from that investor base, which have by far the best sort of conversion and risk characteristics than we have seen from any other channel, and so. The idea is to basically build that into, you know, a very large base of, of investors. It's already surpassed our reg D investor, you know, size that is sort of actively engaged in, in helping, you know, businesses in their community find funding so they can grow their businesses. And so that's ultimately a, a very important strategic part of, of what we're, uh, of what we've been building here. Right. I mean, if the if the main constraint in the industry from a platform perspective right now is borrower acquisition, especially on the on the small business side, you know our competitors are spending a lot of money to acquire their borrowers. They're using loan brokers and other channels with which they have to share the economics. You know, we're we're moving really to a very very strong referral basis where our members become our sales force. And from an enterprise value perspective, we think that's something that is going to be unique because we have this. This you know strong body uh, of members who have you know strong affinity together, uh, and they're out there referring businesses to us. Okay, okay, interesting. So, 
I want to I want to just go back to you know I, I as I said in the introduction I'm I'm an investor on your um, platform and I you know I know you've got this Dutch auction model which I was very curious about and you know it, it operates in a similar way to the old timers he would remember the Prosper auction model I'm curious about why you went with that and you know how much are investors you know, the, the the risk I see it is not is for the investor to, you know, misprice a loan where they're really they're they're, they're bidding it down so much that it uh, becomes less, you know, the returns are less uh, less generous, shall we say, or less appropriate mm-hmm. for the risk. So talk us through the the thinking behind the Dutch auction model, and obviously this is only for the accredited investors and the institutional investors, obviously. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It, it's a uh, uh, it's a very good question. And, uh, you know, in the beginning, when we were raising our first couple of rounds of capital, we had a lot of the VC ask us, you know, why are you guys doing an auction? Uh, Lending Club and Prosper tried auctions, and they moved away from that. That seems sort of, sort of outdated. And the answer for us is that's how you can price in from, from an investor perspective. That's how you can price in the affinity loyalty. What we found was when the investors could set the price, uh, and the way that our auction worked, it, it was actually technically not a, not a Dutch auction, but kind of a modification. We got very geeky about all the different auction models that were out there, you know, study Lending Club and Prospers and some of the other ones in, 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 in Europe and elsewhere. And we came up with a, an auction structure that was sort of unique to us. But, but in essence, the, the investors could set both the quantity of a given loan that they wanted as well as the rate that they would pay on that loan. Now, this is Reg D accredited investors only. They could also see, because street shares transparently co-invest in each loan, they could also see the rate at which uh, street shares priced our portion. So full transparency. The investors, by the way, could, could actually all see each other and each other's bids as well. And what we found was, and again, this was sort of, sort of testing in the early days, this hypothesis that we had around affinity-based lending. What we found was that the investors were actually pricing into their bid the affinity loyalty. So when it was a military veteran and kind of the bread and butter of our investor base were frankly retired, you know, wealthier military veterans who were taking their, their, their retirement money uh, and investing with us. When they were bidding on a veteran owned business, they would bid lower even compared to other investors on their right and left and relative to the risk, they would still bid bid lower. And so for us, the auction was a way of capturing the affinity loyalty through the, through the pricing. And so in essence, a veteran borrower that would come to street shares could get a lower rate by virtue of, you know, being a veteran and telling that story as a part of their pitch. Okay. Okay. That's, that's fair enough. We're running out of time, but I've got a couple more questions I want to get in here. Firstly, you know, in this industry, it's no secret that the, on, the, from the, on the capital markets side of this business, there's not as much investor money as there was six months ago. And I'm curious to see if you guys have, you guys have a bit of a different model, but if you've experienced any of the same downturn that some of the major platforms have experienced in recent months. Short answer is no. We haven't had any pullback on, on investors either at the institutional side or at the, the retail side. We've probably signed up at least 500 investors in the past few months and so which for a small platform is a is is a big number so no we continue to see very strong demand for for the assets and street shares Uh, our approach frankly during this tumultuous time has just been to keep our heads down and and keep building the business that we've been building here which we think is is very very resilient you know kind of through the storms that are here but also the ones that are that are still coming and so we've uh, we focused on doing that, but we have we have not had any pullback on the investor side. That's good to hear. Good to hear. So then, finally, what's what's your vision here for the future? Is Street Shares going to become the you know the largest small business lender in the country, or are you going to really become known for being a Finley lender? What's what's the future hold to you guys? Yeah, you know, we we have set out to build a marketplace lending platform that is durable and sustainable, right? We're, we are we are being very, you know, sort of firm with our credit standards. We're returning great rates to our investors. We're attracting borrowers using a method, this affinity method, that is at a much lower cost to acquire, I think, than our competitors. Uh, and so we're building something we think is 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 very special here. Down the road, I think we take this affinity model and we can replicate it. 
I think a small business borrower, no matter who you are, you can come to street shares and your loan from street shares will be less risky and therefore less costly to you offered at a lower interest rate because we can tap into affinity loyalty. No matter who you are, we'll be able to find your affinity group here as we have multiple affinities running simultaneously. So the model here is a multiple affinity, you know, nationwide platform that is able to really offer, offer small businesses uh, beneficial loans, right? There's some real extractive, frankly, unhelpful practices out there right now in the SME space. You know, we'll have to build something that is, that is sustainable and that will treat, you know, both borrowers and investors fairly. Okay, Mickey, any final words from you? Yeah, I would just say that I think that, um, you know, as Mark said, the, uh, this model is replicable to other, to other affinities, but also potentially into other types of organizations. So we are talking to, you know, several groups where, you know, they're interested in potentially having a private platform for their existing uh, group of customers. And I think that uh, that's a model that I think can be replicated, you know, into private marketplaces. Our, our technology is built in a, in a flexible way that allows us to stand up within days, actually, a, you know, a replica of our, you know, of our platform. And that's something that I think could even be a global opportunity. So we're very excited about what we're building here. I think that we're, we're looking to avoid, you know, a, uh, a plethora of storms that are coming, uh, everything from compliance to customer backlash to, you know, to, to credit quality and regulatory issues. Uh, I think that means that we're building a more sort of methodical business over here, but it's one that, uh, you know, we believe is going to withstand storms. And so we've, we've always knew these storms were coming and, and, you know, hopefully we've built something that, uh, that we'll see it through. Great. Well, um, maybe we'll uh, have a street share South Africa one day. That, that would be interesting. <laughs> but on that note, <laughs> lots more to talk about, but we have to let, it, let you go. I really appreciate your time today, gentlemen. All right. Thanks, Peter. We've enjoyed it. See ya. You know, I have to tell you, I, I sometimes get a little bit envious when I'm in other countries such as the UK or, or even uh, France or Germany and uh, the fact that they have so many options for non-accredited investors, for everyday investors. There, you know, in, in the UK, there's dozens and dozens of different options. And here in the US, um, you know, we're, we're still stuck with uh, very limited choices. So I, I applaud the street shares guys for going through the, the pain of a regulatory A plus offering just to give everyday investors an opportunity to, to invest in this. I, I certainly hope that other companies will follow suit. I would love to see many, many offerings for the everyday investor because that is something that has been severely lacking in our country for many, many years. Anyway, on that note, uh, I'll sign off. I hope you enjoyed the show and I'll catch you next time. Bye.